Fighting Blindness Canada's Viewpoint is a virtual education series that brings you the latest in vision research presented by health experts from across Canada. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about the research we fund and upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. This Viewpoint webinar is proudly presented by Bayer and supported by AGTC, AbbVie, Janssen, Mira GTX, Novartis, and Roche. We'd also like to thank Accessible Media Inc., our national media partner. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Kramer is a professor of neurobiology in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at UC Berkeley. Throughout his career, he's conducted research at Brandeis University, Columbia University, and the University of Miami. For 10 years, Dr. Kramer was the co-director of the NIH Nanomedicine Development Center. He's been the recipient of numerous honors and awards, and is also a founder and member of the board of directors of PhotoSwitch Therapeutics, which aims to develop light-sensitive compounds for drug discovery and vision restoration. He joins us today from California to tell us more about the promising science of optogenetics. Uh, Dr. Kramer will talk for probably about half an hour, and then we'll have some questions from the audience as well. Uh, Dr. Kramer, welcome, and thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you very much, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person, and um, I can't see uh, the audience, but uh, hopefully uh, you can hear me and maybe see what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to tell you about, uh, I'm a basic researcher. I've studied neuroscience for most of my career, and I got interested in vision probably 15, 20 years ago, and uh, over that time, I've got more and more drawn into the question of how we can make the nervous system sensitive to light so that when it ordinarily is in parts of the nervous system that are ordinarily not sensitive in the hope of restoring uh, vision to people with degenerative disorders that cause blindness. So I'm going to tell you about some uh, recent work uh, from the field as well as some uh, new approaches that, that my lab has been taking. Um, and so I'll jump right into this. Um, so, of course, you know, you guys know better than anyone about the diseases that cause vision loss. Um, uh, so they're a, a very simple set of neurons in the retina that, uh, starting with the photoreceptors that detect light, transmitting information to downstream neurons that process that light signal and eventually pass it on to cells called retinal ganglion cells that fire electrical impulses that propagate back to the brain. And in retinitis pigmentosa, the photoreceptors, the rods and cones die. They start dying typically in the peripheral part of the retina, working their way inward over time. And at end stages, all the photoreceptors uh, can be lost, leaving people with no light perception. Um, and, you know, this is a fairly rare disorder. One out of 5,000 people have retinitis pigmentosa, but much more common is age-related macular degeneration, which affects a large percentage of the population of people in their 80s, uh, by some estimates, 10 or 15% of people in their mid-80s have some uh, degree of AMD. And once again, rods and cones die in this disorder, typically in the center of the retina where cones predominate. And um, in both RP and AMD, the rest of the neurons uh, survive. So they're still there, but they're not driven by any light signal anymore. And so they're all dressed up with no place to go, so to speak. Um, and the concept that uh, many neuroscientists have had is that if somehow we can artificially introduce or induce the downstream neurons to directly respond to light, perhaps we could restore some visual perception to, to people. And so that's, that's part of what I've been working on. That's part of what many people have been working on. And you've probably heard about one major approach for trying to uh, get these cells to respond to light, and that's called optogenetics. And optogenetics, um, as it's usually considered, starts with uh, a protein called an opsin. 
And our rods and cones contain opsins. Opsins are what let rods and cones uh, respond to light. Um, and uh, those, those opsins in our rods and cones indirectly trigger an electrical signal. But over the past 25 years or so, uh, scientists have discovered that m certain microorganisms have opsins, sort of distantly related to our opsins, that themselves contain something called an ion channel. And that ion channel can directly uh, elicit an electrical signal. So, so in principle, all you would need to do is transplant one of these microbial opsins, for example, from an algae, uh, into one of the neurons in your retina that survives after the rods and cones are, are dead. And now that downstream neuron would be capable of responding to light all by itself. And so people have used an opsin called channel rhodopsin, which as its name implies, not only responds to light, but has a channel built into it. And uh, that's been sort of the starting point for optogenetics. By the way, optogenetics uh, can be used throughout the nervous system, not only in the retina. Um, it's been a, it become a, a huge experimental tool because now non-invasively, you could just shine light at part of the nervous system and trigger activity, uh, whereas previously you had to do invasive experiments, for example, implanting electrical probes and such. So... So, you know, the idea is that uh, by bypassing in the, in the retina, by bypassing the, mis the missing natural photoreceptors, you can drive the visual system, in other words, the part of the nervous system devoted to vision, by activating these downstream neurons in the retina and hopefully restore visual perception. And so, of course, of, and so what is missing from my description of all of this is how we get the gene for, for channel rhodopsin or other optogenetic tools into the neurons of the retina. And, um, and one way we can do that is with a virus. And this is gene therapy. Uh, you package the gene encoding, let's say, channel rhodopsin into, into a virus called an AAV virus, which, which the full name is adeno-associated virus. You inject that virus into the eye and the virus will infect neurons of the retina uh, and deliver the gene for channel rhodopsin into those, into those nerve cells. Um, so this does work. It works to a greater or a lesser extent, uh, depending on the organism. In, in mice, it works really well, and you can get tremendously good level of infection of, of neurons in a mouse retina. It doesn't work uh, quite so completely in uh, primate retinas, and, and that's one, been one of the stumbling blocks in optogenetics. So I'm going to sum. I'm going to so sorry. I'm going to take a step back here. I've talked about channel rhodopsin, which is one of these optogenetic tools that will stimulate. You use light to stimulate neurons in the retina. There are, you know, other. Um, other kinds of microbes that produce other kinds of channel opsins. One of them is called halo rhodopsin, and it has kind of the opposite effect of channel rhodopsin. Instead of stimulating electrical signals, it can inhibit electrical signals. And so in the retina, the various neurons in the circuitry of the retina, some of them, you know, are, are excitatory, uh, stimulate activity, uh, going downstream towards the brain. Others inhibit activity. And so you can mix and match. You can choose which kind of tool you want to put in which kind of neuron in the retina um, using these viruses as a, as a tool for gene delivery. And, and that gets a little bit complicated. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave that and, and move on to just sort of a summary of what, of where optogenetics is right now. Um, it's been validated in many animal models from mice, from blind mice to blind dogs, uh, to uh, clinical trials in humans in Europe. Um, and there was a report last year from France uh, showing success in restoring vision to an individual who was completely blind 
The vision was, was really rather rudimentary, but it was a sign of success. But it, as I said, it was one individual in this trial that they reported on. Um, so some, there are some other advantages of the optogenetic tools that we have right now. The light responses that you can trigger are very rapid. It's, you know, within milliseconds after turning on the light, the retina begins to respond. And so that's very good. That might give people uh, a vision where they can actually track moving objects uh, in the visual world. The light sensitivity of, of the of the restored responses is is uh, is requires fairly bright light. Um, the color preference is something you can uh, you can have some control over by uh, by mutating the the optogenetic tools. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, the polarity of the response, whether it's stimulating or inhibiting, is something also you can you can manipulate by uh, by genetically engineering the, op the, the optogenetic tools. And an another good thing about optogenetics is that once you deliver the gene encoding, for example, channel rhodopsin uh, to retinal neurons, the gene will persist for as long as you care to look. So um, this is potentially a, a one-shot treatment uh, with, with this uh, with this tool uh, that will restore light sensitivity for a very long time, perhaps for a lifetime. But there are some limitations of optogenetics. Uh, one, as I already mentioned, AAV infection of the cells in the retina is not completely efficient. So only a subset of cells will pick up the virus and only those cells will become light sensitive and you know th that's going to limit how, uh, how what the acuity of vision is going to be. Um, it, it seems that AAV infection is much more effective uh, in a certain part of the retina, particularly in a ring around the the, the macula. Actually, um, it's called the parafoveal ring, and this is something that's been seen in non-human primates. But there's this concern that um, you're going to get the optogenetic tool into one part of the retina and a lot less so in the rest of the retina. And, and once you get the gene in, there's only a limited amount of the opsin that the cells are capable of making. Um, an, an ordinary rod in a human retina uh, has something like 100 million copies of rhodopsin it's really highly doubtful that the cells that are infected by the virus are gonna have anywhere near that amount. They'll probably have more on the order of uh, 10 to 100,000 copies of, of rhodopsin. And so that's of, of channel rhodopsin. So that is gonna limit light sensitivity. So I think, you know, there's the, the idea that people uh, getting optogenetic therapy may have to wear some image intensifying goggles in order to enhance the image, make it brighter. So uh, that would make it possible to be seen. And, you know, uh, so when you think about genet genetic modification, permanent genetic modification of a human, uh, that's, a, that's a benefit because it may solve the problem in the long term, but it could also be a drawback if it causes unintended, undesired consequences, it may be impossible to reverse those consequences. So that's made progress in terms of treatment of humans, you know, uh, happen relatively slowly because um, we need to be careful that nothing, nothing awful happens. So, so that's that's optogenetics in a, in a nutshell. But there are alternative approaches to optogenetics uh, that also can install light sensitivity downstream of the of the rods and cones that have degenerated. And I'm gonna tell you about, about this work, which has occurred in my lab um, in uh, thanks uh, in part to the help of a chemist named Dirk Trauner, who, uh, who designed the, these light sensitive chemical compounds that we call photo switches. And this approach we call optopharmacology 
in contrast to optogenetics. So basically it's optogenetics without the genetics. So there's no genetic manipulation required. These are just small molecules that undergo a, a, a transition when you shine light at them. And they, the molecular structure goes from sort of a, a elongated form in, in darkness to a bent form in, in light. And as the molecule switches those two forms, it has different effects on ion channels. So these are not artificially introduced ion channels. These are the ion channels that your neurons own to begin with. So this is a tool, these, uh, these photo switches confer light sensitivity on your native ion channels. And so therefore they are uh, allowing light to control the sort of native electrical activity of neurons, um, you're not adding any additional uh, channels to the system. And th these molecules act by, by crossing the cell membrane accumulating inside of cells, uh, and they, they have this action of affecting ion channels from the in intracellular side, from the inside of cells. And um, and they can turn on and off electrical activity, as I said, depending on, on whether you're in the light or in the dark. So um, the, I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, history of how we developed these things over the past uh, decade and a half, but we've gone through several generations of, of these photo switches. The photo switch that we think is the best possible candidate as a vision vision restoring, a possible vision restoring agent is called BNAC, that's spelled B-E-N-A-Q. And, um, and BNAC is favorable because it's more potent than our previous molecules. It responds at the right wavelength of light uh, of an acceptable intensity, et cetera. And I will uh, summarize that in a few minutes. But the one way we can tell that these molecules are working is by putting them on a, a blind retina that comes from a strain of mice that uh, have, essentially have retinitis pigmentosa. It's called the RD1 mouse. And so you can take the retina out of this mouse, put it, it's, the retina is a very flat sheet of, uh, of tissue. You just put it on an array of electrodes. Um, these are very uh, small, tiny little electrical leads uh, spaced about a tenth of a millimeter apart from one another. And you can record from about 60 of these retinal ganglion cells. Those are the cells that, that generate electrical signals and send those signals back to the brain. So you can see those cells active in a retina and you can compare a health, um, you can compare healthy retinas and these RD1 retinas. Uh, this is a, rec a rec recording of an RD retina. The neurons tend to be very active spontaneously, um, but as you switch the lights on and off, they don't respond at all. And that's because this retina is pretty much devoid of rods and cones. But if you treat the retina with BNAC for about a half an hour, and then you can wash the BNAC away because it gets into the cells and it gets trapped inside. And once inside, now, now you can now uh, basically all of the 60 retinal ganglion cells that we're recording from respond uh, to light by increasing their, their firing and they shut off when you turn the light off. And this persists for as long as we care to record from the retina. So... This is quite dramatic. We can take a blind retina and make it very dramatically light responsive. Um, and so, you know, th th we've done a lot of experiments to show that BNAC has a lot of the properties that you might wish of a drug that, uh, that might restore vision. So first of all, as I started to say, it responds to light in the visible part of, this, of the spectrum. Uh, that's centered around the blue-green part of the spectrum. Uh, the light intensity you need to get this system to work is equivalent to ordinary daylight. Uh, room night light is probably not intense enough to cause, uh, to allow BNAC to, 
to trigger a light response. But um, but again, you could use a pair of goggles perhaps that intensifies the image, or you could just go outside, I suppose. Um, after injecting into the eye, into the vitreous of the eye, the photosensitivity remains for days, uh, in, uh, in, in mice at least, and, um, and it do there doesn't seem to be any toxicity to the retina at the concentrations we need, at the dose we need to get light responses. And we've done a series of behavioral experiments in mice that show that they're actually responding to the light, to the, to, that these are blind mice. They're responding to, to, uh, to that light after you've introduced the, the photo switch. Uh, the most recent uh, development in this field is was work that we just published last year, which is a new ingredient that encapsulates uh, BNAC. Part of the problem with BNAC is that it tended to uh, sort of um, uh, aggregate and uh, not be a, as effective over time in the eye because it's not fully mixing with the with the vitreous in the eye. But this new ingredient sort of makes BNAC more soluble in the watery uh, solution in, in the eye. And it also spreads it around uh, so that it can reach uh, throughout the retina and it prolongs its action by slowly releasing BNAC. And we can see the photosensitivity is restored for at least a month in these blind mice. So those are all important factors if you're thinking about developing this as a treatment for humans because people aren't going to go in and get an injection of BNAC more, more frequently than about once a month. And, you know, um, we're still a bit away from actually testing this in humans in the United States, but uh, the company that now has picked up on BNAC and is uh, trying to develop it further has planned clinical trials with BNAC in the, with this encapsulating ingredient uh, that will be carried out in Adelaide, Australia, just on a small handful of patients with RP, about six patients with advanced RP. And this is a phase one clinical trial. So its primary goal is just to test safety, but you know, if we'll be able to see if, if those people have any kind of restored visual perception. So this is very exciting uh, and we'll see if it works. Um, okay, so one of the issues, so, you know, now I'm going to switch gears even further and talk about a problem that all of these kind of treatments share. And actually, this may be a problem that is relevant for stem cell therapy, for uh, retinal implants like the Argus 3. Um, and the problem is, or at least the potential problem is, that all of, all of these tools are meant to put back uh, a signal triggered by light. Um, and, uh, and the hope is that once that signal is, is put back, it'll be carried along, it'll be processed in its normal manner by the rest of the retina, transmitted by retinal ganglion cells to the brain, and people's brain will be able to interpret those signals. And that all depends on the downstream components in the retina and in the brain not changing very much. We need to have, you know, integrity of the rest of the circuit. It needs to structurally and functionally be intact and acting normally for the signal to be processed normally. And, but there is evidence, and it, that evidence has been around for quite some time, that things, don't, things downstream don't necessarily stay quite the way they were before the photoreceptors died. And People have called this change in the structure and in the function of the retina, retinal remodeling, and it complicates matters. So what I'm showing you here is a sort of a cartoon almost. Uh, it's a fanciful movie of the changes in the retina. Of course, the photoreceptors are dying, but um, more than that, the, the rest of the structure of the retina starts to change cells start to retract some of their fibers. They start to uh, put, put out new fibers. They start to migrate to different locations. 
And these morphological changes happen rather slowly, fortunately. Uh, in mice, that means many months after the photoreceptors are gone. And in humans, that means you know, years or decades after the photoreceptors are gone. Um, and, and the work that has gone into showing these morphological changes were done by investigators at University of Utah, primarily Brian Jones and Robert Mark, and that's who generated this, this movie. Um, but those are, those are late morphological changes. But unfortunately, there are, in addition to late changes, there are some uh, early functional changes that happen to the downstream circuits of the, to, of the retina. And one of those changes is that the, the neurons, particularly the retinal ganglion cells, become hyperactive. And so, you know, all neurons are capable of firing to some extent spontaneously, even in, in the absence of any input. But retinal ganglion cells, particularly in these degenerated retina, fire at a high rate when the photoreceptors have died. And we can see this with, again, these multi-electrode recordings from, from the RD1 retina. And um, it, so if you think about it, you know, having, as you're losing your photoreceptors, you're losing signal. Um, so ordinarily, uh, activation of photoreceptors causes a signal in the rods and cones that's that sort of uh, uh, easy to see above the background activity of those cells. But in the degenerating retina, the rise of this background spontaneous activity of the ganglion cell starts to interfere with whatever light-driven signals remain. So, so as I started to say, not only is the signal disappearing as the photoreceptors degenerate, but the noise of the downstream parts of the retina is starting to rise, obscuring any light responses. So um, if so, this is sort of the equivalent of what happens in hearing loss when people lose their hair cells uh, and they, they you can go deaf by losing the hair cells in your cochlea. It's often associated with tinnitus or ringing in the ears, where the ringing in the ears is only making matters worse by obscuring any, any signal that remains. And we think that this same sort of process may be happening in the retina, that hyperactivity of the retina is exacerbating the problem of vision loss. And if we knew, so if we could understand and know what is causing this hyperactivity, maybe we can stop it, maybe we can even get rid of it. And the idea if, is that then the whatever small signal driven by any residual rods and cones might be able to better get through and better be per perceived uh, as a visual signal. And so that's been a large focus of our work in the past five or six years, trying to understand what's causing these physiological changes in the downstream parts of the retina. And I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you what we think it is that's causing the hyperactivity of these retinal ganglion cells. It's a molecule called retinoic acid. Um, it's derived from vitamin A. In fact, we think that when rods and cones die, there's an excess of the molecule that is a precursor to ret retinoic acid. And so you end up getting this more excess of this retinoic acid produced. And retinoic acid plays a lot of really important roles in biology, uh, in embryonic development of, of organisms. It's not normally present in the nervous system very much in, in adults, but in these degenerated retina, we have evidence that it's it's there and it's triggering this hyperactivity. And so um, without going into the, any of the scientific evidence for this, I'm just going to tell you there are ways that you can interfere with the actions of retinoic acid. And there's, there's two, two sites where drugs or even gene therapy might be able to stop retinoic acid from, from acting. So you can block the receptor for retinoic acid using chemical compounds that pharmaceutical companies have manufactured for completely other purposes, but never actually 
uh, made it as a drug. One of those compounds is called BMS-493. It was made by Bristol-Myers Squibb. It was made as a potential cancer chemotherapeutic, but it blocks the receptor for retinoic acid. And so it's one way to block this pathway. There's another site in this pathway you can also intervene, and that's the enzyme that makes retinoic acid. That's called RALDH. And the drug, uh, its, its uh, official name is disulfiram, but it goes by a common name, and the common name is antabuse. And this is where the story gets really interesting because, you know, we were talking about alcohol or hearing about alcohol a few minutes ago. Um, it turns out that antabuse is already in clinical use. In fact, it's been in clinical use for, for decades. And of, of course, antabuse is a drug that um, physicians prescribe for alcoholics, uh, not just any old alcoholics, but people that have real serious problem with alcohol. And what antabuse does is it prevents the, the proper metabolism of ethanol and it causes buildup of compounds called aldehydes in your blood. Uh, so if you're taking antabuse and you drink, uh, you will get this uh, buildup of this toxic compound in your bloodstream and that compound makes you feel really, really sick. So people that, you know, the idea is that to deter people from drinking by giving them this drug that's going to make them really sick if they drink ethanol. And it just so happens that that same drug blocks the production of retinol acid. And so we have these two different, you know, sort of nodes, two different points for interfering with the retinol acid pathway. Um, and, and the idea is that this pathway is corrupting vision. So the prediction is that if we introduce these, you know, if we gave mice the, these compounds, mice that are going blind, maybe we could improve their vision. Of course, this won't work once all the photoreceptors are gone. This is a treatment that requires some degree of the photoreceptors still being there. And, I, and, and so I'm going to go through this quickly. We just find a time uh, when some photoreceptors still remain and where the hyperactivity that's a sign of the retinoic acid act, uh, you know, doing this corrupting thing. Uh, we find a time where uh, in, in mice, in the life of these mice, when those those two processes are overlapping. In other words, the mice still have some photoreceptors, but they're experiencing hyperactivity that's corrupting their vision. And then we give mice these drugs at that time point. And what we see, and is and this is again, these recordings of the activity of the retina using a multi-electrode array, we see that both disulfiram, in other words, antabuse, causes a dramatic decrease in the spontaneous activity of retinal ganglion cells. And so does BMS-493, the drug that blocks the retinal acid receptor. And perhaps more importantly, when we test visual behavior in these mice, uh, we find, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this, uh, the, the exact behavioral test, but it involves, it involves just briefly mice seeing an image on a computer screen and uh, jumping off of their running wheel and going and poking their nose to get a, a water droplet re reward, which is delivered only when the mice can see this image. And so we can test their vision by changing how clear the image is, by changing the contrast of that image or the brightness of that image. And we can compare vision in a normal mouse to vision in a mouse that's going blind to vision in a mouse that's going blind yet has been treated with one of these drugs. And that's shown uh, uh, here. Basically what we see is that, um, you know, mice before their photoreceptors degenerate have a characteristic uh, ability to see an image. That, that, that uh, ability degrades as the photoreceptors uh, degenerate, but if they're given disulfiram, in other words, antabuse, for about a month, 
uh, their, their ability to see this image is almost no different than, than it was before the photoreceptors started to degenerate. I should mention that antabuse in humans is given it as a pill. And in these mice, we just uh, lace their food with, with antabuse. And so they're getting a daily dose of it just by eating their food. And for BMS-493, we had to inject the compound into the eye uh, but and, and then look at a much ra more uh, rapid time after, after that injection. But just like with the antabuse, we see dramatic improvement of vision uh, in these treated mice. And so um, we... Uh, so it turns out because antabuse is already FDA approved, and like I said, it's been so for decades, uh, we've been able to arrange with our colleagues at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, a clinical trial that's gonna involve something like 30 to 35 uh, patients with um, not quite end-stage RP, and they're gonna be given antabuse in a double-blinded crossover trial which should begin sometime in 2023. And once again, we'll see whether this, um, instead of restoring vision to people that are completely blind, revives vision to people that have uh, increasing vision loss. And so, so just to summarize, you know, um, there, we think that, you know, using these light sensitive compounds or in the case of, uh, of retinoic acid using using drugs that block this uh, remodeling process, there's there's uh, different strategies uh, maybe best uh, uh, used for different parts of the of the population uh, for either restoring or reviving vision. So for people with no light perception for the end stage patients um, with RP, you know uh, those are the first. Uh, patients for which clinical trials have, are being carried out using optogenetics, using things like channel rhodopsin, uh, and using retinal implants like the Argus-3, and, um, and maybe using photoswitches as well and stem cells as well. Um, but, um, but, you know, for, for patients, so, and all of, these, all, of these, uh, all of these potential treatments carry some risks and that's that's one of the reasons why uh to start with uh you know the the population of people that are going to be uh, tested first are going to be those who have a complete vision loss to begin with because of the risks of interfering or uh, uh altering or somehow impairing remaining vision you know are, is is not there but what about for the very large population who have very low vision, who are maybe um, you know legally blind, but still can perceive light? Up until now, you know these vision restoration treatments haven't really been appropriate for such people. But we would suggest that retinoic acid inhibitors, either the either drugs related to the molecules I've just mentioned, or perhaps gene therapy. Uh, might be appropriate for these for this much larger population of people with low vision, and these two strategies, the the these treatments to revive vision and the treatments to restore vision, don't need. They're not mutually exclusive. They can be added together. The corrupting influence of hyperactivity is not only going to interfere with your ability to see with remaining photoreceptors, but also possibly your ability to, you know, to see after getting uh, stem cell treatment or optogenetic treatment, et cetera. And so, you know, this is, this is basically the, the idea um, that, that, you know, there's, there's a new sort of uh, strategies for, for potentially treating vision. So I wanted to acknowledge, and I'm not going to uh, name all of these names, but the people uh, that were really responsible for the work. This was all really their doing. Uh, I'm just the messenger. Uh, this, my lab has been full of graduate students and postdocs, um, sort of too numerous to, to mention. The people whose names are, uh, are bolded are the people that did the latest part of this research. Um, we've also had collaborators around the world. 
uh, that have been heavily involved in this research, including I mentioned Dirk Trauner, who's now at NYU, um, and our friend Michael Gord, who's at UC Santa Barbara. This research has been supported by many organizations, including, including uh, notably the Foundation Fighting Blindness uh, in the United States. And uh, in the last year of uh, a gunned Harrington project that we did with Foundation Fighting Blindness, Fighting Blindness Canada stepped in and actually supported the last part of this work. So we are very thankful for that support. Uh, as well as the support from the National Eye Institute of, of the NIH. And I, I should disclose that I have a financial interest in a, a company that we established called Photoswitch Therapeutics that is interested someday in commercializing um, some of the technologies that I've talked about here. And so I'm, I'm very happy to uh, answer questions. It's a little too bad I can't, uh, there's no camera there for me to see you, but I can hear you and I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. We have time for a few questions. I'm gonna start right over here. Thank you. Do you have any idea of a timeline before we will see this with people for the um, um, oh gosh <laughs> the optogenics yeah well so so optogenetics was already being you know there are trials going on in Europe and I think in the United States and like I said there was a a very high profile paper that came out last year about the result a very, very limited report about uh, those trials, about one individual patient in France. So I think I think that, uh, you know, there'll be increasing trials with all of this, you know, depending on the success of the of the of the of the very first trials that are happening. So if, if they look more promising, there'll be increasing uh, studies, you know, moving from from phase one to phase two to phase three. And can I ask you, um, will this be something, if you have the optogenetics and something else comes out later that would help, like a stem cell, would you still be able to have that or would that prohibit a, you from having it? Well, that's a good question. And, and you know, one of the issues with the gene therapy approaches is that they rather permanently, um, you know, in the case of optogenetics using uh, microbial opsins, they install a light sensitive, a, a protein, a gene that encodes a light sensitive protein rather permanently. And so, you know, it, it remains to be seen, and sorry about the pun there, uh, how that would interact with other potential therapies like stem cells. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, I think that's good timing because I think we do have to move on to the next one. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer, for taking your time on a Sunday to join us. Okay. Thank you.